Hello and welcome to episode 10 of Friending the Mirror. Today's episode is titled From Bullied to Celebrated, and my guest is Michael Bloom. Now, Michael is an author and a certified coach, and he has helped a lot of people. He is the author of The Accidental Caregiver's Survival Guide, Your Roadmap to Caregiving Without Regret, via the book, speaking, via his book, Speaking and Personal Coaching, Michael has used his personal experience to energize hundreds of caregivers with soul-saving coping strategies that support them in saving lives, including their own. I know Michael through his online courses, including his Facebook, Facebook fan page, Party Success System, and the webinar training series called Hangouts Got Convert. What most people don't know about Michael is that as a child, he was bullied for being overweight and smart. You can learn more about Michael's, Michael, his book, and access free caregiving resources and Mikey, Michael's coaching and speaking services on his website at www.caregivingwithoutregret.com. So what I'd like to do now is, without further ado, introduce Michael and ask him to tell his story about being bullied. Well, hello, Don. It's so I, I so much appreciate the invitation, and it's so great to uh, be on your show as a guest. And uh, and thank you for such a warm introduction. I'm actually uh, today discussing a topic with you that I have never discussed publicly before, and that is that uh, as a child, as you said, I was bullied. I was bullied repeatedly, probably between fifth grade and seventh grade uh, by other uh, kids at the school. And in fact, at seventh grade, it really took, uh, probably got to a major point of uh, really being bothersome to the point that I didn't even really want to go to school uh, because I was in fear of, of being physically, actually at the time I didn't realize it, but actually being physically assaulted. It was not uncommon for me to be shoved into lockers um pushed around in the bathroom um if you or anybody else that's watching has uh i used to really enjoy the show glee that was on that just ended the series this year and the students that were part of the glee the singing group in the school they were getting harassed by many of the the jocks and the other students in the school they would get slushies in the face i never got a slushie in my face but i had a number of other sort of the name calling. And as you said, the primary things that seemed to really pinpoint uh, the bullying was the fact that I was an overweight child and that I was intelligent. And the third component is my name. If you notice on my, uh, my uh, lower third, my name is listed as A. Michael Bloom. Now I go by my middle name, which is Michael. My parents started calling me that right away using my middle name, but my first name is Abram. Nobody ever called me Abram. Abram was my grandfather's name. On my father's side, he had passed before I was born. So I was given the name to honor him. Um, but my grandmother actually didn't know the name was going to come out that way until after my parents released it and notified them with the names were. And she said, everybody should call me Michael. So everybody, including my parents, followed suit. But let me tell you, every first day of school in a new classroom or when the honor roll got posted, it said Abram Bloom. Well, that yet gave the kids another reason to tease me because I went by Michael. And when they found out I was Abram, that related to the Bible or Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, it just added to this whole sort of geek mentality. And uh, I, you know, it was just a very, as I think back on it, all the things that it, it was a really tough time. But the message I really want to get across, and we can explore this later. And, uh, and the reason I'm excited to talk about this topic now is I know a number of kids, and this is really bullying um, and anti-bullying programs have really come to the forefront of talk over these last years. And I think back at the time, and I think, Don, you and I are probably in the same generational group, but back at the time we went to school, 
we just kind of dealt with it, but it did not get the notoriety. There wasn't the social media spread to capture videos and share things like they are today. But the message I want to get is even though many kids at the time had bullied me as I got to know them or reconnect with some of them in adult life, it's a much different situation. I knew who they were at 9, 10, 11 years old is not necessarily who they are at 30 you know, or 40 or 45. And some of us are getting older than that now. So, so it all changes, but that's why I was excited to come on to actually talk about this topic. Cause people see me, they think I've been really together and happy, but as an only child who was targeted for being smart, overweight, making the honor roll, having the funny name, um, even being Jewish that was brought up a few times, I really went through some, you know, like I said, some really difficult times. And I missed a lot of school in seventh grade because I was physically sick. And I know that the stress, the mental stress and the fear led to those physical illnesses. Now, um, seventh grade, help me out here. How old you would you have been in seventh grade? I, have so I would have been about 12. I would have been about 12, 12 years old at yeah. that time. Yeah, and I was in middle school that only had seventh and eighth graders. So the eighth graders at large like to bully and pick on the seventh graders. In fact, the nickname for us was Sevies. But those of us that were more of the geeky group, we were targeted more. In fact, I had a friend that was a, a girl. Her name was Susie. And I actually knew she was a smart girl. She was actually very pretty. Um, she was not I mean, she was an attractive girl, but she was very smart, honor roll student. We were always at, like, the top of honor roll list. But the girls that and boys that attacked her one day, they actually shoved her so hard um, into a locker, they actually broke her arm. So it was, that's how bad it was. I mean, you know, I know that, um, I mean, the one thing that we didn't have to deal with is cyberbullying. But, yeah, we definitely, I was never, like, physically assaulted the way you describe. I, I'm very fortunate that way, but certainly the uh, name calling and the mental abuse and, and whatnot and lack of friends. So I totally get that. Um, but it sounds like it was kind of an epidemic in your school that there was a, a group of kids. I mean, and it almost sometimes kind of sounds like jealousy. I mean, maybe not about the name, but certainly about uh, the fact that you were smart and on the honor roll. I think that was, you know, you know, like I said, I think that was a big part of it. Definitely, I'd say there was probably some jealousy there. But again, I think kids at that time, and we see it now with the cyberbullying or others, they will act on whatever they think is the perceived weakness or, I mean, even though honor roll is not a weakness, but, um, you know, they, they, they will choose whatever they think will most get at you and use that. The verbal things were actually easier to handle than the threat of the physical what I would call actually looking back on it now, physical assault. I mean, I was I was actually threatened under scalding water in the gym shower um, one day. They didn't raise it, but they threatened to do it to me, but just got my face under cold water and then threatened to make it really hot. And, um, you know, the our gym teacher actually walked in on that event and broke it up. But these were the things that I was, I was dealing with at the time that were just very much... Um, they were very difficult to deal. I mean, they were just very difficult to deal with. I was just so upset. And my parents were strong advocates for me, but advocating did not, not always make life easier. So yeah. I was afterwards. just going to ask you, what kind of support system did you have? I mean, obviously you had friends that were experiencing some of the same things that you did. But what about the adults in your life? What about school staff? Uh, what about other kids at the school? Yeah, so when it got to really uh, a tough point, when it got observed by a gym teacher that time, that really actually helped. Um, the one thing I have to say is uh, he talked to me very carefully afterwards, and he actually ended up taking me a bit under the wing, um, his wing a bit. And uh, we actually, um, I actually was able to have a conversation with the assistant principal because he was saying when I reported to my parents what happened, um, they stormed in the next day with me to talk to administration because of the fact that I was being threatened with scalding water. So, um, and was, you know, really was assaulted. So some things they did put in, they didn't call it an action plan, but definitely an action plan took place. So 
the gym instructor, when I went into the locker room for changing, I was able to kind of tag along as his assistant. So it was kind of like he became my guard in the gym. So I didn't have to worry about that. Um, and then, you know, other positions, we made changes such as the honor roll. They actually agreed to print my name with my middle name and not my first name. So we got rid of that from being there. And that actually morphed eventually into using a Michael Bloom um, for, for everything going forward. And that's kind of what I carried with me. I like the way it is now. I don't, I don't change it, but I'm saying these are where the seedlings of those things came in. The administration did rally, but there were still times things would sneak through, but it was really when it was caught by an observer who was an instructor or teacher that he really took action, which was helpful. Yeah. I've, uh, that definitely, and that's the key, because a lot of times, what, some of the stories that I hear is that uh, you tell the teachers, and it's like they don't believe it. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I would never do that, or because sometimes some of the kids that actually do the bullying are good students, or they're nice people, and you just, it's true. If you're an adult and you've had good experiences, it's hard, it's hard to believe that people are capable of that kind of behavior. Absolutely. And I actually found some of the kids back in the middle school, you know, especially when they reached eighth grade, because the eighth graders tended to be the bulliers and the seventh graders, the people who were bullied or picked on or tripped when walking to the bus, or I can remember these things. Some of the more geeky eighth graders started engaging in those same behaviors to join the cool group. Okay. I never did that stuff. But I saw a few of them actually transform during that time because it got them out of being targeted. It was easier to start sort of targeting others, so you're no longer the target. And it kind of got them in with that crowd. So those were a rough, um, I would say, couple years for me. Fortunately, when I got to high school, things very much improved. Because of my experiences in the middle school, I was able to transform on roll listings name listings at the beginning of the year, we were able to head things off. And and I think as kids kind of matured a little bit as going through that, I was no longer fortunately a target in high school. Now, did you, you had to cope with this. I mean, you said you missed a lot of seventh grade because you just were literally afraid to go to school. How did you mentally recover from that? Yeah, so it's a good question. I did have some physical things going on at the time um, that got me to doctors, but I really think um, I had, really, I don't mind sharing, but I had a bladder infection for one thing that just would not go away. Um, tried different medications. It finally did. I was really convinced that this infection and my issues with stomach pain and everything was, I don't want, I in no way would say it was psychosomatic, but that my stress was leading to my physical problems. I really felt physically ill, but I think it was the stress and knowing of returning. The other thing that happened with that bladder infection is I obviously had to go to the bathroom more often. And because I had to go to the bathroom more often, that put me in situations that were potentially dangerous because of the bullying from the kids. So it was easier for me when I had those days of feeling uncomfortable to stay home the guidance counselor and the school teachers, and because we had worked with assistant principal, were really great about getting homework. Even though I missed a lot of school, I still maintained excellent grades and um, completed all of my assignments. I just missed a significant amount of school over the course of a couple of months. And uh, But yeah, people, the adults, yeah. stepped up to the plate. You probably did better in school than a lot of the kids who are attending full time. <laughs> I might have, you know, you know, with that. So again, I was diligent with the work, but again, I was just really fearful of the, bat, like I said, bathroom trips, and especially after the shower incident were really kind of freaky to me. I would almost say, you know, to some of these kids, and I don't think a lot of adults or other kids that have ex have an experience this realize, you almost have a PTSD kind of a feeling to certain things when certain things happen. I mean, um, you know, even walking in that, just that locker room, and making sure, you know, there were times that the instructor who took me under his wing got called to other things, you know, that he had to attend to. He really couldn't dedicate himself to being my full-time bodyguard, right? So so when he stepped away, I would have a little bit of fear, even though things didn't happen to me, um, because he basically told these kids what was going to happen to them, probably in words that would not be appropriate today. Um but, uh, you know, but again, it, it became clear, but I had that fear, 
you know, I had that fear while there and it just was tough. But, you know, looking back on it, again, these are all growth experiences. Again, I want to give the message that even though I had rough, bullied childhood years, some of which were scary and unhappy, my adult life has been far from that. My high school experiences got better. My college experiences were wonderful. I'm collaborative. Now people, I have a global audience of people who follow me. Um, who want to hear what I have to say, I think I provide them value and expertise. So that's really a part of my human experience, but I think it can help me relate because it's interesting people I meet along the way, some of whom are very smart and actually very attractive people who also experience some bullying at a young age. So it's really a common issue. Yeah, and one of the things, I mean, that's just it. I mean, now you're confident, you're successful, and you do provide value to people in their professional lives and personal lives as well. And so I think what people are going to want to know is how did you make that transition? I mean, you described having a gym teacher who was able to almost be a bodyguard to you. And so did that help build your confidence? You said getting into high school things helped. And in my own memory, I, I have to admit, I, I'm one of those that kind of blacked out a lot of things. Like, were you bullied? Well, no, not really. Actually, yeah, I was. I just repressed all the memories. But when I was reminded and did remember, it was middle school. So that's interesting. In high school, I was just largely ignored. But my point is, again, coming back to that, is what steps did you take mentally? Was it just a natural progression? The less you were bothered and bullied, the more confident you became? How, how did that work for you? Well, that, that's a really great question. And I think the adults stepped up to the plate, but I think my parents played a big role in it. I mean, no matter what happened, my parents always let me know that I was special, I was loved, I was valued, and I would always be safe with them um, and that they would do anything for me. So I think having very positively involved parents um, uh, was a big help. I think also between seventh and eighth grade was my 12th into 13th year age-wise, now that I think about this. And it's interesting, I'm thinking of things as you're asking them as you talk. Um, the summer after seventh grade, I'm a June birthday. Um, so June uh, of that year after seventh grade was my bar mitzvah. So there were a lot of people there. You're the source of the celebration. Um, it's, it's kind of your gateway into more responsibility and manhood in the faith. So many people giving, saying great things about me, talking about how great they thought I was going to be growing up. These kinds of things kind of become self-fulfilling prophecies when they kind of say that, you know, my career did not take the direction. Ultimately, I had no idea I was going to become an entrepreneur. I mean, as you know, my story a bit, you know, I, I worked in the health and human services field for many years after graduating um, with a master's degree in psychology. It wasn't until my dad became terminally ill suddenly in 2009 that I put my career aside as an only child and stepped in to care for both of my parents who needed, at that then needed full-time um, live-in support. And I ended up caring for them over a several year journey that ended up being their end of life journeys. But my parents, I really would attribute a lot of my um, growing up well to their efforts. And then also I think resilience. I mean, I think resilience plays a great role. You know, again, I think if the bullying had continued through high school to the degree it had been before, I might not be where I am today. But fortunately, you said you kind of entered a period of being ignored. I felt like I entered a period of mainly being ignored except for the close few friends I had. And that was fine. I didn't need all these other people. But now, many of the people that had bullied me back then would very likely seek my support today and be very happy and impressed. And in fact, um, I am reconnected with some people in high school, not those that were were my uh, worst bullier, shall we say, but, but people who saw some of the things that were happening. And certainly, um, they're very supportive of things I do today. These are things that happened way back then. And uh, I put them you know, I put them aside. But again, I, I was happy to come on this show today to talk about it. Because again, there's been these campaigns lately to say it does get better, it gets better. If you are raising a child, or if a child happens to be watching this or a young adult teenager who's experienced this, and is in a really tough place because of it, seek support. 
and realize it does get better because what you see in this moment does not have to be who you are in the next moment. And it certainly won't be who you are a decade from now. So uh, it's so it's so important to put that in perspective. But when you're going through it and you're in this hell, <laughs> it, it's very it's very hard to see, you know, what could come. Yeah, I, I, I believe that the support aspect is probably the biggest part. One of the things that I encourage people to do if they see someone who's been picked on in an unfair way, even if they don't want to get involved at the time, just say something later to that person and just say, hey, I saw what happened. I know it's wrong and I just want you to know I'm sorry and not everybody feels that way. Because I, I think it's important. I mean, we are social creatures. The fact that you had a teacher step in, and I had teachers that were influential in my life, in my confidence, and in my development also. So it's adults, but it's also a fellow students. And you're right, sometimes even just having a few friends, a few meaningful, important friends is important. And did you also then, because you say you had friends that were being picked on, were you in turn able to act as a support to them? Oh, certainly, certainly. And, uh, you know, I remember my friend that had her arm broken, she was out of school a few days. But, you know, as much as possible, some of us would try to, you know, there's, they said there's strength in numbers. <laughs> so if we had classes that were back to back, we tried to walk together in the hall, or we tried to do different things or meet up, it wasn't always possible based on logistics and timing between classes, but absolutely. Um, and certainly when it came to with a few, I know my mother banded together with a few other people. And um, many times we were able to avoid riding the school bus home because a group of parents of kids that were the smart kids would shift giving rides home. So we were able to get out of the troublesome school bus ride, which could be another place for picking, being picked on. Oh yeah, I totally get that. I've had my share of that one too. So you mentioned, I mean, I suppose now in your place of confidence and success and whatnot, I, I remember when you told me that you'd never told the story before. And I knew, I know that people who've dealt with these issues do have trouble coming forward and sharing their story. I, I still talk to people as like, yeah, I have a story, but I'm not ready to share it. So how hard was it for you to, to actually come out and decide to share the story? Uh, that's a great question too. Uh, it wasn't really that hard. I mean, when you, cause I, I knew I wanted to be on your show to support your efforts. Cause I think what you're doing is great. And I wanted a way to contribute because, you know, part of it is facing up to it, right. You know, we're facing up to it and, you know, it was, so basically, um, I, I view sharing this story as something that could hopefully lead to a positive transformation you know, in others. And I'm all about providing support and resources to do so. So if my story could help inspire somebody else to realize that no matter where you were as a child, you know, I'll give you an example. I actually, because you know, Don, I do caregiving workshops as well. And there was a story that stuck out to me a couple of years ago. Uh, I had a workshop that I was doing and there was a person that was part of it. This was a team of professional caregivers. And he was actually direct support staff supporting people with disabilities. He told the story and he grew up in another country. He's from an African nation, but he grew up in, in a country and his family were his bullies, his family, other friends, because they found him slow. They called him stupid from the time he was a little boy. And even as a young adult, he wanted to go to college. He wanted to get a higher education. And people in his family and others were telling him he wasn't smart enough. He was this dumb one. And he chose to no longer believe that story. And the reason he shared it, I thought shared it very courageously during this talk with workers, coworkers, was to really share the point that he actually decided uh, two years earlier to apply and get his associate's degree. And he was close to completion, even while working full time. And that when he started getting good grades, he realized he really wasn't this dumb person that everybody was making him out to be. But that was bullying and harassment from people that are close to them. So what I want to bring up too is although my bullying experiences were from people not related to me, they were my schoolmates, bullying can sometimes happen within families, can sometimes happen 
um, within, you know, family units and to recognize that even um, don't listen to those voices. Don't hear those voices. If people are putting you down and you're determined and you have a belief and you have some talent that you know you could build a skill, go for it. Don't hold yourself back because you will prove, you you yourself can prove your worth just by going forward and trying to reach those dreams and goals you've set for yourself. Yeah, that is probably the hardest thing for people to do is when they've been told something, especially by, by people who are close to them, told all their life, well, you can't do this. And I mean, we like, ideally, we want that to be the other way around. And that's what I talk about with the support system. We want the people who are close to us to build us up. I mean, not to the point of entitlement or where, oh, yeah, you, you're fine. You can do anything because that's not true either. But I think it's important that, and it's hard when people are constantly told something either by people they don't know and people they do know, sometimes jumping over that mental hurdle and saying, well, I'm not going to listen to them anymore because that's not true. I don't believe that. I'm not dumb. I'm not incapable. And I think that happens a lot with people who have differences too that might have a physical disability. But I mean, they, people, other people put limits on, on you that you don't necessarily have to believe. But overcoming that, that's probably the hardest thing. Would you agree, Michael? I would. I would totally agree. And like I said, in my former professional life, I was supporting people with disabilities, um, working with them. And I certainly heard many stories from people and their family members about the teasing and the bullying their they got or their children got as a result of being different. And uh, and it's really, it's really sad. But the idea is, you know, everybody has the potential to do something. Um, and the idea is to set forth and, and, and really make it happen. I know it's hard when you hear those inner voices and some of those could be scars that are difficult to overcome. Mm -hmm. But the key is to seek support. Do not be afraid to talk about it. You know, I never personally, I was fortunate. I mean, I, I didn't see a therapist to talk about my issues with bullying. If I needed to, I would do so. I mean, I have no problem with people doing that, but I, definitely people stepped up to the plate to help me at the time. Um, I took the initiative to, you know, help myself as well, embark in strategies, made clear what I thought was necessary to help. I'm telling you, my suggestion to change my name on the honor roll was saying, which went the entire rest of my school experience right through senior year of high school, was my suggestion. And they did it, and they kept implementing it afterwards. How empowering is that to have something like that happen? So, so again, I just bring it up that that's where I think, not sure if I'm getting to the point that I want, the point is, again, say what you need, share your ideas, be respectful of the adults or the others that are there, but make it clear that you're at a point of fear and that you're a point of, you know, real fear of harm and see what could be crafted to change the dynamic of that. You know, it can happen. Yeah, I can see. I mean, what I believe Michael's suggesting is you also need to be proactive in your own experience. You can't solely rely on everyone else to do things for you. It's important for you to speak up uh, in your, on your own behalf and, and help come up with the solutions that are going to make things better. Now, Michael, I wanted to ask you about the projects that you have going on, because I know you have a bunch and I want, you to, I want to give you this opportunity to share all these things that you're doing in your life now to help all kinds of people. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, you know, here on, um, for caregivers, I know caregiver caregiving affects many, many people that are out there. And for the last four years, I've been running a caregiving coaching business, which launched while I was still caring for my mom after my dad passed. And the venture started as a means for have something flexible and home-based so I could keep my mom out of a nursing home and take care of her. After she passed in 2012, it then moved into a full-time venture. And in 2013, um, I uh, wrote and released my first book, The Accidental Caregiver Survival Guide. Um, folks are very welcome to, and even Dawn, afterwards I can send you, make sure you have the links. You can feel free to post with the replay if you want. But uh, 
folks could access free preview chapters of the Accidental Caregiver Survival Guide at the Accidental Caregiver Survival Guide.com. Um, or if you go to my caregiving website, there is a book tab there as well at caregivingwithoutregret.com. Now, my caregiving um, business is not how, John, you met me. You met me through other online activities that I've been doing because it, it, as a result of publishing my book, The Accidental Caregiver Survival Guide, I started doing my own online marketing and I've actually generated five figures in book sales with that book by mastering some uh, organic techniques on both Facebook and with the use of Google Hangouts. And I've actually launched a second business with a business partner. Um, his name is John Schumacher. And we have a business called Hangouts That Convert. And that can be found at hangoutsthatconvert.com. And uh, Don, I know you've taken advantage of our resources. And if you are watching, um, have expertise or some knowledge to share with the world, there's no greater platform that's accessible to us right now than Google Hangouts, which is how we're actually broadcasting this interview right now. And uh, we've been really privileged. I've really been enjoying training others on how to use the platform to magnetize their perfect audience that they are meant to resonate with, that they're meant to support. And for those that are really looking to do this as authors, coaches, and consultants to actually make money with their online offerings. And that's what Hangouts That Convert is all about. So I invite you to check out, we have a, a free Hangouts 101 guide there. So again, I, I thank you for the privilege of being able to share those resources, Don. Absolutely, because I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm here is because Michael and John started that um, webinar thing. And I thought, well, what a great idea and what a great way for me to get my message out. Because even if I don't have a ton of people watching live, it creates an archive on YouTube and whatever. So all of my all of my episodes are available for people to watch pretty much any time. And the messages are going to be relevant for many years to come. So Michael, before we close, I wanted you, did you have anything else to add about your projects and your business? Are you well, it's just hot off the press because this is the new book, John. <laughs> hey, it's marketing mastery. Um, halfway through. Yeah, and it's coming. It's going to be released formally June 9th. It's going to be the day um, that's going to be coming out. And uh, so that that's the other thing. And Don, I know you have, um, you're looking through the digital copy. So we're getting close to releasing that book. So we're excited about that. So, but uh, thanks again so much for having me here. I've really been enjoying this. So. Yeah, so now, of course, I want to get back to the, to the meat of the conversation again before I close, and that would be, I realize you've given a lot of good tips and whatnot, but if you had one thing, an action item for someone, and they could be a young person, an adult, whatever, who's in a similar situation that you were in, what would be the one thing that they could do today that would help start making a difference in their life? Really good. So again, I, I would give them the one thing that's really important for them to do is talk to someone they trust about what's happening with them. But don't make it just about what's happening to them and the negative. Talk about what they would like to do if they didn't have all this nonsense of bullying happening around them. Find somebody that you can trust that's going to boost you up. And the other thing I would say too, if you have any thoughts of all, that this life is not worth it, you know, reach out to that trusted person. There is nothing that it could be happening in this moment. I guarantee you, if, if a young person is watching this or anybody and you think your life is worthless because of the teasing and the harassment that you're getting, I went to being dunked under very cold water and then threatened as the water was being warmed up that I was going to get water burned that I was going to get scalded, that they were going to put it up on high. And uh, I, I almost felt like I was being, I'm bringing this up again, but as I look back at this, like water tortured, in a sense. I wasn't waterboarded. I wasn't weighed on a board. But when you, I had four boys holding me up to the shower that was coming out right into my face. I may as well have been waterboarded. And it was frigid water, and they were warming it up. And the one boy was telling me, it's going to, about to get very hot. We're going to burn your face off. Now, if I could go from that moment to talking to somebody um, and realizing it does get better, that's really, and I, now I'm making it very vivid for you, 
um, your experience might have been worse than mine. We are all in our own bodies. We all have our own experiences. Don't go it alone. Share how you feel because I guarantee you, you're somebody's child. You may be somebody's sibling or you're somebody's friend and you matter to those people. Okay. And it's important for you to realize that you matter to yourself. Your life is worth it. So seek support. Talk to someone. Thank you very much, Michael. Normally I would ask for questions, but I'm not seeing any indication that we have any live viewers. And I also am not 100% sure that my chat's working, but I can deal with that later. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on. I was very privileged to have Michael interview me for the very first for the premiere episode of Freddie Rivera back in January. And I was able to tell my story, so I'm pleased that I was able to bring him back on and have him tell his story. So that was, uh, for me, it's an important part of the evolution of the show. So thank you again. I would also, let's see, um, next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, June 9th. All my webinars are special to me because I get to pick the guests, right? And the woman who's coming on on the night, her name is Christina Pearson. And she is the founder of the Trichotillomania Learning Center, shortened to TLC. And what that is, trichotillomania, for those who don't know, is compulsive skin picking and hair pulling. And I actually have been a trichotillomania sufferer. I think it's kind of like alcoholism. You are always, you always have that issue to deal with. It never like goes away or is cured. But I have been, I actually am very proud that I have eyebrows because uh, I had trichotillomania. So I'm excited to have Christina on my show on June 9th at 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Now remember, as Michael and I were emphasizing today, part of what is important is not only being kind to other people, but make sure that you are kind to yourself as well. Thank you very much. And hopefully I can get, one of these days I'll be able to do this and it'll be totally fluid and no problems. We are love, we are one. We are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace, we are war, we are how we treat each other, nothing more. We are how we treat each other, nothing more. We are how we treat each other.